All right, hello everyone. Nice to have you here. I wanna make sure that you can hear me. So if someone can either give me the thumbs up or just type in the chat box. So I know you can hear. Okay, wonderful. And then hopefully you can see the screen where it says seven practice problems. And we have that as full screen. So um, if you need to minimize it on your screen and be able to take notes or something like that, feel free to go ahead and do that. But otherwise we make it full screen. So hopefully you can see the details. So, um, oh, I see some people are saying where they're from, lovely. Um, can someone also just let me know that you see the slides? Okay, great, thank you. Um, and we're gonna do a live Q&A at the end, which quite frankly is always my favorite part because you bring such great questions. So that would be wonderful. Um, but I'm gonna just jump in and start doing it because um, of course I put so much content into one webinar. Um, I'm always guilty of that. So um, let's dive in here and thank you for sharing where you're from. It's always um, fun to see. So um, I've got Kelly, our wellness director from Body Love Cafe on here. So feel free to, ask questions as we go along. And again, I'm gonna um, get questions at the end so you can always put them in the chat and then we can jump right to them um, or you can ask them live at the end, whatever you're comfortable with sounds good. Okay, real quick, I'm just gonna show you a disclaimer. It is an educational course. Um, I always do my best to make sure I'm sharing the most current relevant information but always make sure you check for your own license and um, check with your advisors and things like that. And again, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, here's the exact order of what we're gonna cover today. Um, I just wanted you to know, so in case there was a section that didn't pertain to you, but one you really wanted to hear, it's coming. So patients, personnel, paperwork, practitioner, protection, profit and prevail, a lot to get through. Um, I'm going to very, very briefly um, introduce myself. I'm not trying to withhold anything. If you want to know more, I'm happy to answer it. I just always am so excited about the content. Um, but this, I tried to sort of shove a bit about me all on one page. Um, my health journey, people ask about that. I have the experience of having been the patient. I was um, very, very sick, uh, declared permanently disabled um, for years. And I had seven specialists in my life, eight medications and a medical treatment at the hospital that cost over 700,000 a year. And they said that would just be my life forever. So that's how I found functional medicine, probably similar to how a lot of you may have gotten into um, some of these you know, wonderful um, protocols and modalities and this system of looking at the body as a whole. And so because of that, um, I was able to heal enough to come back into the world, start Body Love Cafe uh, as a tiny little place that um, very quickly um, expanded, in fact, twice in the same year to uh, 22 walls, multiple practitioners. Now we have a team of 14 and we can see patients in most states um, and some other countries um, and really a, a multidisciplinary practice we're unusual in the sense that we really stress training. So not only is there a lot of training involved, even for these wonderful professionals that come to us with so much knowledge to begin with. Um, but then we have about four hours of ongoing training every week. So our clinic's a little bit different because of that. Um, as far as my professional background, I'm a fifth generation female entrepreneur. So I'm not sure I had a choice. And um, I've uh, had many businesses. I've helped people with many businesses. In my previous career, I had a client list of 20,000 and taught um, highly effective and ethical branding, marketing, sales, speaking. I created a, um, you can see a picture of it there, a personality profiling system with uh, that was published by McGraw-Hill out of New York. I'm going to actually give you a free version of that that's specific to patients and practitioners and how to communicate. Um, and then I train practitioners, really not in competition with any other organizations. Like I'm IFM certified. I love IFM, highly recommend it. Um, my course is very practical. Um, and the only reason I even do it is I saw too many friends and colleagues, you know, get out of school, whether it was medical school or 
um, osteopathy, chiropractic, um, IFM, whatever, and they just didn't know how to like make it in business and succeed. So the, they're very practical, clinical and practice um, classes that you can, you know, get going and, and have the practice you like. Okay, that's my short version. Any other questions, just ask me later. And then let's dive in. Okay, so patients, personnel, paperwork, practitioner, protection, profit, and prevail. Seven things. So let's do it. Um, all right, so the first one, patients. Um, now, we're not talking about the clinical stuff today because we could get into that. Um, and I have many free trainings I'm happy to share that um, talk about some of the clinical issues. And I don't mind answering questions at the end. But right now, we're talking about the business of having a practice. So um, the first thing is, first of all, you need patients, right? And especially when I'm working, like I've worked with... Um, you know, emergency room doctors, um, obstetricians, radiologists, um, internists, uh, pharmacists, psychotherapists, uh, psychiatrists, all these people that may have been in a hospital setting and then they switch gears and they want to do this functional medicine thing and all of a sudden they're a business owner. And, ah, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot. And one of the things is that you have to have patients or there's no business. So how do you try to patients in an ethical way? Um, I'm actually, I put the link there and, and maybe Kelly you could put it into chat, but um, I'm teaching a class for Designs for Health, which is a supplement company. And I think it's actually next week. It's a free class, but I'm going into, it's literally like everything you would do marketing uh, in 2022 to get patients. So you're welcome to attend if you want. Um, but I'm going to sort of just cover one idea right now that works very well, which is, you know, teaching classes to the public and potential patients. And you don't have to be salesy. You don't even have to make an offer or anything like that, because I know there's some people out there. In fact, I even have some colleagues down the street that, you know, they're like really aggressive sales tactics. And I don't think that makes anyone feel good. You don't have to do that. Uh, we're very low key about that. And um Practice can just build naturally year after year um, being that way. So if you like sales calls, I can teach you a good way to do it. I'm not a fan of sales calls. So even though I'm really good at it, I don't want to do it. So I set it up in a completely different way. I recommend full transparency. I put prices on the website. Um, it's just a very different method. But teaching classes to the public is a great way to position yourself as an expert and do what I call instead of giving back, you give up front. Um, and so, you know, without looking to get something back from it, it just always typically makes you feel good, especially if you like to teach, it's my favorite thing to do. Um, but also things just naturally come from it over time. So, and if you are gonna teach a thyroid class, you're going to get all of a sudden a new rush of thyroid patients. If you're gonna teach about um, uh, heart health, you're gonna get a, a rush of uh, cardiac patients. You know, that's just how it works. Um, leveraging your existing patient relationships to increase referrals. Now, if you have some type of physician license, you cannot do any type of financial compensation um, for referrals. Um, if you don't, it might be possible. Um, otherwise, there's just a lot you can do as far as just, you know, asking for referrals or sharing what you do or asking about how other family members are doing. Sometimes you might have a patient come in and like, let's say it's ADHD or depression. You know, those are conditions that are very much a family condition because even if no one else was um, sick or injured, they impact the whole family. So really, you just have a whole family of patients that you need to work with in those situations. Um, sometimes offering family plans can be helpful. And we'll talk a little bit about the structure, um, the various structures of your practice. But sometimes um, there's a way, if you have a cash practice or whatnot, to create a family plan. Um, again, no referral gifts. Sometimes you can do a raffle, but check with your legal advisors because depending on your license, you can be sort of like skating a gray line there. Um, so if you do do something like that, it has to be available to everyone. There, there really has to be no requirements for it. Um, so some certain rules that are, that are important. 
Um, and then also there can be patient problems. So we're not doing the clinical part right now, but just patient problems as far as, um, you know, compliance can be an issue. Because when you're talking about functional medicine, we're talking about a partnership, we're talking about a lot of um, responsibility on the patient's part. You know, we're not doing stuff to them as much as we're doing stuff with them. So, um, you know, the role of coaching is invaluable in functional medicine. So you're probably doing that in your practice, or maybe you've hired coaches. We can talk a little bit about that in the staffing section. Um, and then handling conflict. So that's why I gave you that freebie resource. Um, it's not as detailed as the book, but that's fine. There's really plenty in there. So I'm not saying, oh, go buy the book at all. Just get the free resource. And there's a section in there that um, is a practitioner to patient and talks about each sort of personality type and how they handle conflict. If you really read that, I think you'll find it very, very helpful um, for how to deal with your patients when they don't get the results they want or they got upset or grumpy about something they couldn't get in when they wanted or someone accidentally sent them an invoice twice. You know how people are when they don't feel good, right? Um, so that will really help you just like how we do individual medicine, we need to do individual communication with people. And there's a little bonus section in there um, about staffing because even the people you hire are going to have different skills and different personalities and you wanna put them in a position where they're gonna succeed. Okay, so there's just some of the business part of patients and Kelly shared two links. Uh, if you have questions about those, um, let her know. This is what it looks like, by the way. I didn't put all the pages in because it's a screen, right? I only have so much space, um, but the character codes at a glance on the left, it's gonna tell you about all six of them, you know, how they move, how they think, what they're concerned about. There's a quiz if you want it, great. You don't need to ask your patients to take it. Quite honestly, I'm gonna give you enough information that whether you're seeing them, you're doing video or you're talking on the phone, you're gonna know who they are right away. And then there's that practitioner to patient secrets, um, even some stealth, what I call stealth techniques for when there's a conflict, how to diffuse the situation. Okay, so please, I hope that's a benefit for you. Okay, number two, personnel, all right? This is your team. Now, if you're brand new and you're just getting started, you might be doing everything. You know, you walk in, you're the clinician, you walk out, you have to be the front desk, you have to schedule appointments, you have to, you know, make collections. And, you know, that's fine to start. And, and some people, that's all they do. And, and that's okay. But most of the time, even if it's just one assistant, that can really uh, make things so much smoother for you. So the first thing is recognizing when you need help, and especially if you're getting to the point where you're feeling like overwhelmed. Um, and if there's any resentment or anxiety or reluctance to go to work, that is a sign that you don't have systems in place that are really helping you. And you might just not have enough help that you can count on because a good team just, you know, keeps you going. It makes you feel sane. It's essential. If you want to do your best work, as a doctor or a healthcare practitioner, you need a good team. So if it's your first time hiring someone or you need to hire someone new, the big issue is gonna be the budget for it. And I know every time I've hired someone, it was always sort of like a little bit scary because first of all, I, I do my best to run a debt-free um, practice. And that's one of my specialties is te teaching people how to um, create a good practice without debt. Um, so every time I was hiring someone, it was sort of this like leap of faith um, and the leap of faith. It wasn't just in the individual, because I'll talk a bit about how you hire them. But the leap of faith was, oh, I need to go and spend this money. And I'm just going to have a leap of faith that that increase is going to come in naturally. Here's what I'm going to do to build it. But I'm going to trust in the growth process. And really, it's worked every time. Um, so for hiring for the most part, we hire pretty slow. In fact, I teach a whole webinar on that. Um, I haven't done it in a while. So if you're interested, put a little note in chat and, and I'll teach it if you want. But I have a system that I call, um, we're, our clinic is called Body Love Cafe. So I would call it um, hiring um, the next Body Love Cafe 
superhero employee. And it was actually modeled after the amazing race. So it was a six week hiring process, but I'm telling you, I just got gems of people um, from that. So it's really worth it. Um, and you spend a lot of time with these people, right? You want, you want people that you care about and people that care about you. Um, and you want to hire for your values. So people often ask me, um, what is, you know, your, what do you value the most when you hire a body worker? What do you hire the most uh, or what do you value the most when you hire another practitioner? What do you value the most uh, when you hire an admin or a health coach? And it's a different thing each time. Um, so, and my thing might not be yours, right? Um, and then there's the difference between employees versus independent contractors and virtual assistants. Um, they can all be helpful. You want to make sure you're following your state's rules and regulations. In California, for example, um, they tightened up over the last couple of years. So some of my independent contractors became employees and things like that. Um, so understanding that. And then, um, and security is important. So if you are hiring a virtual assistant, you don't want to just jump in and hire someone necessarily from a different place in the world. I mean, you can, and they can be wonderful, but not without um, security uh, systems in place and understanding what you need to really protect the uh, PHI and all your backend information, your financial information. So I can tell you a lot more about that in the Q&A and tell you the systems I use. So if that interests you, I'm happy to share all that. Um, when you do teach a new employee, especially if this is your first time, have them document everything as you're teaching them. So you are building your um, office manual as you're doing it. Um, if it is, if you're teaching something with video, record it, then that can be watched later. So whatever you try to do, you want to um, create a system around it and not have to duplicate it. Um, if you don't have benefits, right, there's, you know, you might be used to, or some of the people you're hiring might be used to like a corporation where day one you have um, health insurance and retirement all that and if you're a, a small um, solo practitioner or a small clinic starting out you might not have any of that available so what is it that you can offer for that person um, what is maybe um, a different benefit maybe it's something tangible or not what um, makes it a desirable workplace for them what builds loyalty um, I think those are really important issues. Um, and then control issues and micromanaging, especially if you've done it just on your own. Um, first of all, you have to be willing to ask for help. Um, you have to um, ideally not micromanage. And they might need more help in the beginning, but you're going to have to let go of the reins of that or you won't get the help that you need, which means that person isn't you. They're never going to do it exactly the way you want. You can get it pretty darn close. Um, but otherwise, you're going to have to say what what is good enough, right? Um, and then also giving your team um, the ability to grow and bring ideas to you and invent things themselves. I think that's really important. And if you look at what people value um, in a workplace, um, I, you know, when I I read research on this, so a part of it. It, you know, it's not just benefits and income, but part of it is being respected as a human being, having like um, being able to contribute their ideas, um, feeling like they're involved in something that's bigger than just themselves. So um, if you can bring that into your workplace, I think that's really helpful. And then also showing gratitude in some way or another, whether it's um, financial um, increase, whether it's some other type of bonus, whether it's a fun day or a gift or something. Um, but just remember people first, right? Okay, let's talk about paperwork. So most people don't like paperwork, um, but you know, it's just part of the name of the game. Every business has it and healthcare has it a lot. So systems are really essential to not go crazy. Um, are you paper versus electronic files? We were a pretty heavy paper clinic on purpose. 
and then sort of saw the writing on the wall the last year and a half and went virtual before most people did. It was a lot of work to change and I really looked into what systems I thought were the best to use and then we put in that work. Now I help clients do it in much faster time. Um, but uh, no matter what you use, of course, HIPAA is going to be very important. Um, knowing how to prep in advance. So whether you have paper files or electronic files, how do you pr uh, prep for those patient visits? And one of the things I'm always trying to teach my practitioners, you know, for sanity's sake, I like them to block you know, they have full control over their schedule and autonomy, right? But I, I try to encourage them to block certain times for their patient time and other times for dealing with paperwork or admin or marketing or having a life and being done. Um, but for, let's say Thursday, today's Wednesday, right? So let's say Thursday was the day and I was going to see a bunch of patients then. My goal would be about 90 minutes for doing the prep for tomorrow and then I'm done. And then I'm charting uh, in my EMR while I do the visits, I'm sending after visit summary immediately after the visit and then I'm done. And that's very doable. That's how I do it. That's how I teach a lot of other people to do it, but you have to have systems in place and you have to have a good team to make that happen. Um, you wanna automate everything you can. So it's a little bit of time to set that up front, but then it's time saved later. Um, HIPAA compliance, I'm gonna talk more about that um, in a second here. Um, and I already mentioned the, the percentage of time for charting. And then if you're a solo practitioner versus running a clinic, just understand that, um, you know, if you're a solo practitioner, you're going to have a certain amount of time handling your own phone calls and emails and things like that. Um, otherwise, you can sort of predict it. If you're a multidisciplinary clinic, you're going to have a lot more admin time, a lot more paperwork, a lot more hand holding and coaching and dealing with fires. So just make sure um, you think that through because everyone in their mind tends to think, you know, when I was a patient and I found functional medicine, I had to use different practitioners, very common. And so if I want to give the best care for my patients, I want all those practitioners in my office. So it's very normal for people to think and feel that way, but they don't realize what it's like running that type of clinic. So make sure you like that. I really like helping others. So for me, it works, even though all that admin and paperwork is a pain. I just like working with others. So for me, it's good. But if you really don't like all that admin, then having a smaller clinic or a solo practice will make more sense for you. Okay, number four, practitioner. Um, this, is, this is all about you, right? So first of all, um, crazy go mode. Very common if you're starting. Anytime you start any business, it's work, right? It just takes time and effort to build it. But that go mode can only last so long. So you have to understand the reality of running and growing a business and then the impact of stress, even when it's exciting, right? Stress is stress. So whether it's stress from fear and terror or it's stress from this is so exciting and I love functional medicine and having my practice and this is wonderful and I'm working insane hours, stress is stress. So um, you can't stay in that state forever without, you know, paying a price for it. Um, and then work-life balance, you know, especially for some of the women, um, you know, on the call, you know how hard that can be. And for some, they can make it a reality. For others, it feels like a big myth. What I tend to see more is, you know, sort of blocking and, and chunking different um, times, like multitasking versus hyper-focus. Some of us, men and women, might be really good at multitasking. It's a skill, but you sort of, um, it takes a toll on you. You pay a price for that. So that's not um, ideal in the long run. So I find if you can hyper-focus on one task at a time and, and take it to completion and finish it, it's much better. Um, and then as far as like this work-life balance, I describe it more like an uneven pie chart that varies. So you only have 100%, right? And it's not like, oh, 25% is work and 25% is kids and 25% is my partner and 25% is, um, you know, my self-care. There may be moments like that, but instead it's more like uh, this month, 70% was work 
and everything else fell in that 30%. And then next month, maybe 50% was the kids. Someone had an issue and they were taking a lot of time. Work only got 30% and that partner got five, you know? So understanding that it shifts like that. And I think that's fine as long as it shifts. If it were to always stay like that, like if the kids always took 70% and the work got very little time, that would be a problem. Um, and if the work always took 70% and everything else got so little, that would be a problem too. So just making sure you do move that around a bit and, and that when it's not working, you look at it and you shift, you know, like I, I describe it like getting your ducks in a row and you get them all lined up and then someone in the front gets out of line, you, get them back together and then someone in the back moves and get that together and someone in the middle pops out. I mean, that's life, right? Um, and then what is your vision for now and in the future? Um, so that's very important to have a clear vision because then we can build towards it. So if we know what your vision is, we can create it. If you're just, if there's no vision and you're just sustaining, you know, it's nothing's really gonna change. Um, and then building for time off. I think that's important. Um, I took the whole month of May off. It was beautiful. I, I loved that. And I didn't just take the month of May off. Like I told my team, unless you're on fire, don't call me. I'm not even going to have the phone. I told my family the same thing, <laughs> you know, my extended family, not the family I live with. And um, it was like the first time in forever I'd driven a car without a phone in it. So I, I was completely off for a month from work. I was off the phone. I was off electronics. Um, I went on a little occasionally to like take a picture or something like that. But um, otherwise, I put it all away. I was off social media. Everyone said, oh, you're going to lose your mind. I said, I don't think so. It actually took me, even though I'd gone back to work, it took me two and a half months to go back on social media. I, thought, I don't want to go back on. This is great. Um, I did a bunch of gardening. So I highly recommend that. And it's only with systems can you build something like that. So I will be taking at least one month off a year, if not two, if I can do it um, from now on. I just think it's so essential. All right, let's talk protection. Um, I'm not an attorney, right? This is educational. So make sure you do uh, consult with your advisors. Um, but this is sort of like the basics to advance. So first of all, legal entity. Some of you might start as a sole proprietor, perfectly fine. You might become a corporation later, or you might be a corporation right to start with. There's pros and cons, understanding that. Um, of course, you need your malpractice insurance. You need to understand um, when you hire people or other things you might need contracts for. Um, do you need a business license, a permit, a DBA, a bank account for your business? Are you doing telehealth or telemedicine? Um, some of those things are, are really important. Um, one thing about insurance, I sort of mentioned this at the end, so I'm going to come back and pick up HIPAA here. But um, some of the things you do in functional medicine, they might be a little bit beyond your typical malpractice insurance, depending on your license. So if that's the case, you can pick up an extra insurance. In fact, I can share with you, I think I have an affiliate code somewhere that will get you a link, but I have an extra insurance that I use besides my malpractice and it covers, um, you know, different activities. If you teach a lot, you might want teaching covered or body work or being an herbalist or doing yoga or nutrition counseling, um, acupuncture, cupping. I mean, it's really sort of broad and quite affordable. Now, if you have more than one insurance, they will not both cover the same incident. So if there's some incident and your malpractice insurance covers it, you don't use the other one. But if it was, for example, um, I don't know, you're acting in the capacity of something outside of your regular insurance, then you'd have that extra one to pick it up. Uh, which also brings me to like, where do you practice? Um, you know, things loosened up quite a bit over the last year and a half and um, telehealth was more broad. Um, I use alternative balance. Um, so I'm happy to send you that information if you want. I have a pretty cool handout on it um, and I have that link, but they should have a website that you could just go check them out too. Um, and Kelly, I think you have that link actually from our last team meeting. So if you want, you can post it. Um, okay, so things loosened up for uh, telehealth, which was nice, but I always like to be ahead of the game. So in our office, we actually really tightened up, sort of the opposite of what other people are doing, because I envision where it's going to go next. 
So what we're doing, um, which really is the most legal way you can be, I know there's a lot of other coaches out there that teach differently and they just say, well, how much risk are you willing to handle? And maybe you're willing to handle some risk for yourself. But when I have a multidisciplinary practice, I like to have zero risk because I have other people involved and I always want to take good care of them. So really the best thing you can do is not practice anywhere except for where you're licensed. And, um, and you can't take that hat off. So if you have a professional license and you're a medical doctor or a chiropractor or a naturopath or a psychologist, um, you can't say, well, I'm going to, I do health coaching too. So I'm going to be um, a chiropractor in California and a health coach in New York especially if you're ordering labs and going over it. So the best way to do it is just to use someone who's licensed in that state if you have a practitioner who can order labs or don't see people in that state. Um, there's probably plenty of people in your own state just to serve. And so what we do is we just list the states that we have someone licensed for. And if it's a state like uh, Minnesota and we only have one person licensed for it, then they get to see that person. If it's California and we have 10 people licensed for it, we just match them up with their best person or whoever they want. So um, that's what I recommend. Okay, let's talk briefly about HIPAA compliance. Now, you know, HIPAA is really, you know, it's really built and designed for these hospital settings and it can be challenging and expensive to the solo practitioner, but we still have to follow all those rules. So it's not just um, giving that HIPAA policy form to the patient on day one to sign, either in person or electronically. Um, you need to have a HIPAA binder. You need to have a HIPAA officer. Even if it's you, if, you're, if it's just you, guess what? You get to have a meeting with yourself as the HIPAA officer and train yourself. Um, that's just the way it works. But as soon as you have one more person working with you, then you definitely really need to step this up. Um, you have to have six um, meeting audits a year. Um, so our HIPAA officer and myself, every two months, we just go through, we take notes for the binder, and we just look at all of our systems and make sure everything's working. Does there anything need to change? Um, all new people get a HIPAA training. And then once a year, we do an annual team training and we record it so it's available, but also we just try to get everyone on it all at one time so we just check it off and it's done. Um, now, email, if you're using Gmail, let's say you have a website like Wix or um, Squarespace or something like that, and your practice, like ours, Body Love Cafe, so you're going to be um, Dr. Smith at Body Love Cafe, you can get that professional email and you can sign what's called a BAA, um, a business, business associate agreement with um, Google and they say your email is compliant, but that's not the end of the story. And unless you dig deep, you don't know this, but um, it's own, email is only compliant, Gmail is only compliant when it's sitting in the box. As soon as you send and receive, it's not. But you can make it compliant if you sign up with an additional double encryption service. So that's what we do. Of course, it costs extra and it's a pain, but that's what we do. Um, also, HIPAA compliance will extend to like your drive and your calendar, but not contacts. So you have to delete all your contacts and turn off auto saving contacts. So like when you go to send an email and it auto populates that patient name, have to turn that off or it's not HIPAA compliant. So that's a pain, but it just is what it is. Um, and then um, how are you gonna handle passwords with your team? We use a secure password um, system. So they're really uh, compliant passwords. Um, if people are working from home, working remotely, if they're working on personal devices, we have a personal device form. There's just all these extra little things. Um, we even, everyone on our team signs a BAA with us. So um, I share all these forms with my clients and I know it's a little bit of a pain, but once you get it done, it's done. You can even set it up. Like we use Jane software app. We just set it up in there and make it easy so they can just sign it electronically. Um, already covered additional insurance coverage. You might also need liability if you have an in-person clinic. Um, you, might need, you might want to have disability insurance. Um, we could talk about dismissals a little bit if you want. I just wanna be mindful of time. So let me keep going and then catch questions. And you're welcome to type in any questions as we go also. 
Okay, number six, we're gonna go to seven. So we're gonna get it done. Number six, profit. Um, a lot of people, especially healers, they don't wanna talk about this, right? They just wanna be the doctor or they just wanna be um, you know, the hands-on healer or the energy worker or you know, wherever you are, you've got a big caring heart, right? That's a big part of why you got into this. Um, but you're running a business now and so you have to price it for profit. Um, I'm notorious for pricing things low. So I have to always make sure I'm covering expenses. So I'm like the exact opposite of price gouging. But um, I have to make sure all the practitioners get paid um, and then all the expenses get paid. So you have to figure that out and then build in a profit because you don't want to just be working as a not-for-profit, right? Um, there's got to be something growing for all this work that you're going to put into it. So how to price, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I'm a big fan of a supply and demand method. So that's what I've used. And I can answer some questions about that. Um, and then you have to deal with money issues. So if you have a lot of money issues, got to clean those up um, and many different ways to work with it. You can um, talk about it. You can do handouts and exercises on it. You can work with a consultant like myself about it. You can do some energy work around it. I mean, you know, or you could just dive in and do it. Um, and then are you going to have a cash or an insurance or a membership practice or some type of hybrid? So pros and cons to all of those. Um, and I'll answer questions about that. We have a cash practice. Um, we don't take insurance, but we will provide um, super bills. And then I have clients who do all sorts of different things. We don't have a true membership practice, but we do have um, sort of a um, a very low key little optional membership that has some bonuses if our patients want to do it. Um, multiple income streams. So multiple income streams for sales and also for marketing. I call it throwing spaghetti against the wall. You know, if things change, um, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. So being able to have different income streams is important. Um, and I think this is really important in practice. And also, cause like as a human being, I don't wanna be treated this way. I want things that are really ethical. I wanna avoid conflict. Um, so no referral fees, no MLMs, no bait and switch, no aggressive sales calls. That's just like how, that's how I like to practice. Um, and then big versus small, there's not one way that's right. Um, and it's also not even like what you make. So a lot of times when we talk about how much did the office gross, okay, fine. It gives you an idea of activity, but it's what you keep. So someone could have a really small practice and have a much higher percentage of income than someone who has a very big, impressive looking practice, but it's a smaller percentage. And these different practices have a really different expense ratio. So I personally could make a lot more money just practicing by myself and have a lot more time off. Um, and I know I could do that at any time. For some crazy reason, I like working with a lot of people and I like helping them. It's a lot more work and the income uh, ratio is a lot smaller, but I enjoy it. So I do it. So you have to make sure if you're going to do something like that, you actually want that and you like that. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can have a small practice, tons of times, off, tons of time off, very low overhead, and and be very happy, and then everything in between. Okay, number seven, prevail. This is going the distance and avoiding burnout. Now, if you're in the beginning, you're thinking, well, how could I burn out? This is amazing. I love it. Trust me, it can happen, especially if you're an overgiving person. So you have to watch like lack of boundaries and not having time to like ground yourself and disconnect from the people in your day. If you're a highly sensitive person like I am, you have to understand it's gonna take more time to disconnect. So quite frankly, I need a lot of downtime. Even if I'm doing work during that time, I need a lot of time where I'm not actually talking to people. And I love people, but it's just how I refuel. So understanding the way you are. Some people refuel and they have to like be in a social setting, right? Um, they feel better if they go to a concert and it's crazy. So just setting it up so it works for you and giving yourself permission to switch gears if it's not working. Um, where are you going? That's sort of what we mentioned earlier. Where are you? Are you like at the start of practice in the middle or at mastery? What's your end goal? Um, do you want to just do one thing? Nothing wrong with that. Um, or do you want to do two or three things? 
you might want to do more because you have ADHD and you get bored if you don't do a lot of things. Um, you might want to do more things because you're looking for some tax advantages and some write-offs. Um, you might want to do something else because you've had a creative inspiration. You want to invent something. So um, lots of options. Like we're getting closer and closer. Boy, I tell you, it takes forever. But we're getting closer and closer to re, uh, releasing our lab software app, which will do the functional medicine lab analysis for you, spit out what it is, lifestyle recommendations, supplements, all of those things. I really did not need to do that, but I liked it. It really helped me have less time and more sanity in my practice. So I've been using it for over five years with patients. And then um, I just wanted to make it available to others. So chose to do that. Um, taxes, investments, and retirement. Uh, you're going to have to have some financial savvy or just pick it up along the way or work with some good people because you have to grow beyond money for time. So whether you do it because you um, leverage a different system at your clinic or maybe your clinic is just small, you're a sole practitioner, you do always work with people, sort of that money for time thing, um, then you're gonna need to do other types of investments, either conventional or creative, because you're gonna have to be able to grow to hit your retirement goals. Okay, I'm gonna take questions here in a minute. I just wanted to share like some other options for support. I have tons of free recordings. I'm always happy um, to share. And if, um, if you want it, you could shoot over um, an email, just send it to team at thefunctionalmedicineacademy.com. So team at thefunctionalmedicineacademy.com. Um, and I have a handout with a bunch of uh, resources and recording. I could just give that to you. Um, some are practice-based, but a lot of them are very clinical, like Dutch training and SIBO training, uh, uh, coaching Q&A, those types of things. I do do individual coaching and consulting. I only work with a small amount of um, clients, so I tend to do groups more, but I do have some people that I help one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then I do Functional Medicine Academy, which we're about to start our live classes again. So I'll just show you that briefly and then take some Q&A. So um, this is the link if you want to see it, tinyurl.com FMA class. You could take whatever class interests you or you could take all of them. These are the classes. So it's just seven classes. Like I said, it's very tight program, very practical, very get in action. They're all like a day, a Saturday, um, where I just bust through everything with you. It's about four to six hours of content. So we go pretty deep. And then I do up to two hours of Q&A where we workshop it and really get into it. And then um, once we do these live dates that are upcoming, um, if Kelly, if you have them, you can put the live dates in there. Otherwise, I can show them to you another time. Um, the first one is... November 20th, so pretty soon, 10 days from now. Um, if you can't make it to the live one, you just watch the recording. There's quite a lot of notes, quite a lot of handouts. So FMA1 is all about um, your exam, your intake forms, your database, communicating with patients, um, the report of findings, um, talking to the patient, all of that. And then the rest are clinical, really get in deep. And then FMA6, that's the only other one that's not clinical. Um, that's all about marketing. And that is a very, um, very thorough class. Whether you're beginning or advanced, I guarantee there's gonna be something in there for you. That one's on December 4th, by the way. So all the other um, clinical ones are gonna be January, February, March. And then if you want a certification, you don't have to do it, but if you want it, wonderful you do um, a certification test, a case review, and then you'll be a certified practitioner. Okay, I want to be able to answer questions for you. So if there's anything that's come up or you have something you know, just live you want to ask, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and if I answered everything, then great, but usually there's some question uh, that comes up along the way or something that maybe I didn't, get through in as much detail as you were hoping for. And Kelly, if you have any questions, you can throw those at me also. Can people unmute themselves or do we have to do it for them? Yes, they can unmute themselves. Okay, great. 
So any questions about any of the topics we covered or anything else? There was a question. We're going to email this out to everyone. Okay, let me see. What's the question? Yes. Just asking if we could email this out when we were done. Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Um, and overwhelmed with the protection category. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's talk about that a little bit um, and where to begin for solo practice. Um, first of all, anything that's, you know, big and crazy, you just start with piece by piece. So I often, um, when I'm, and I cover this in FMA one, by the way, in a lot of detail, like how do you literally start? Like, what's the first thing you do? What are the things you have to have on your website? So, um, without having, you know, all those notes to give you, let me just tell you sort of some basics. One, you want to have a practice name. And we can have a conversation over, do you name it around yourself or do you name it as something else and the pros and cons of that? Sometimes it has to do with, um, do you want to sell this practice later or do you, um, do you want to, um, do you want to be out there talking and you see your name or do you want to be talking more about an entity like maybe in the beginning using that royal we and then you're going to expand and other and bring other people in so part of it is sort of your vision if you will um, but you need a practice name and then if you're a sole proprietor you know you can sort of just hang a shingle out the door and start that way um, you can use your social security number but i recommend just contacting the IRS and applying for an EIN number. And that way you don't have to give out your social security number. You're still a sole proprietor and you would just use that EIN. You only ever get one, by the way. So if you're the kind of person who has five sole proprietor businesses, use the same EIN. Um, so you only get one EIN as a sole proprietor. And then if you incorporate later, you will get a new EIN as the corporation. It's a separate uh, entity. And as a minimum, most corporations, you have to pay at least $800 a year um, in corporate tax. But um, depending on whether you do like a, you know, S corp pass through entity or not, there's certain advantages tax wise, you pay less self employment income, there's certain things you can write off. There's another layer of legal um, uh, protection as far as um, um, as having a little separation. So, uh, so anyway, let's just say simple, you're starting as a sole proprietor, that's fine. You need to have um, policies in place that you're going to have your patient sign. What are your basic office policies that you start with? And I give out handouts and examples of those because there's a few that I think are really important to have covered. And you do need to have give out that HIPAA privacy notice. Um, and you need to give out some form of informed consent. So that's sort of the bare minimum to begin. You'll want a bank account. You need to be able to accept payment. You need either a place of business where you rent a little space or you're seeing patients virtually. And then as far as a website, um, when you have a website, you do need to have things like terms of use and privacy policy on there. So I, I go through all that, but that's like the bare minimum to begin. And then we just start adding layers and that's fine. Here's one more form you need. Let's bring that in. Once it's in, it's in and, and it's easy and it's done for. Um, but you don't, you don't have to do everything at once. Um, how do we structure pricing for patients? And how long is your practitioner training and the cost? Can you give some details how often you meet? Yes, so the, that link I shared, there's two, that, there's two things that will show you all about it. Um, the, the functionalmedicineacademy.com website, if you can put that in, that tells you a lot about it, including the pricing. And then the, um, the FMA class is the actual landing page that tells you more um, the different cost options. And if you click, you're not gonna like be forced to buy or anything like that. It will show you the different things you can buy and some of the meeting dates. But um, anyway, it's mo most of it's a class you can do on your own at your own pace. If you wanna become certified, you have to do it within two years. Um, you could do it in as little as four or five months. Um, otherwise, we've got live recordings starting November 20th and going into March. So we're doing a live recording for each one. 
it's all day Saturday, but if you can't make it, no big deal. You just watch it as, as a video. And we divide, we edit the video into little sound bites. So it's not like you have to sit there and be held hostage for a whole day. You can just watch a, you know, piece by piece. And then um, if you want to become certified, you can do the test online um, and do the case review. So it's to make sure you know what you're doing and you're competent, but it's not to like torture you and have it be crazy, challenging and awful. The test is 10 questions from each of the courses. So it's a 70, um, it's a 70 question test. And if you watch them, you're gonna get it. Um, and then for those who do the, you can just take one class, no biggie. For those who do, um, who do the whole thing, then we have um, group Q and A's. And then sometimes we get in there and add extras and I might add bonuses, but that's basically the program um, and very detailed content. I give you all the slides. We give you a detailed notebook with each one. So it's not just the slides, but like that first notebook is probably 130 pages. It even includes all these different exam procedures. Um, and they're all like that. They all have notes. And then I give you specific handouts that you can use with your patients if you want or tweak them. Um, it might be an intake form. Like it took us years to build the perfect intake form. I give you that, that kind of stuff. Um, so ask me other questions if you need to, but hopefully I'm getting close to answering that. Um, structuring pricing. So for myself, I like to do... Um, you know, supply and demand. So in the beginning, when I started day one, plenty of supply, very little demand, right? I think I had three visits my first day. Um, so it was very reasonably priced. And then here were my set hours I was gonna see patients. And as that, um, you know, got bigger, uh, this is that link by the way. Yeah, right there, FMA class. Um, I knew I had it somewhere. Um, as my schedule filled up, I would then increase the price. So then maybe there were a few people who couldn't come as often. Um, so maybe the schedule would open up a little bit because I had a price increase and then it would fill back up again. And then I'd increase the price again. So that's how I like to structure it. Now I have some clients I work with and they want a boutique practice. They want a like more concierge service. They want it high end and that's perfectly fine. But we have to set up the website and the services and their availability and their marketing. And yes, they're gonna have to do sales calls in a very different way. So anything's possible. I'm just sharing what I personally like, but you can create it any way you want. And truly you have to know that and understand that. Some people would rather grow slowly and have a higher price, that's fine. And others, they'd rather have a lower price, grow really fast and be in it, especially those who are new because there's nothing that's a better teacher than just being in it and doing it. So if they want you know, a full schedule, then pricing more reasonably that people can get in and fill up is a good way to start and then you increase your price. I can tell you though that I increased my price twice um, during, uh, uh, 2020. <laughs> so, you know, no one else was doing that, but I did it twice. Um, okay. So let's see what else. Um, what do I use for malpractice insurance for DC license? I use NCMIC. Uh, there's many out there, but, um, that's a big one and they've been around for a long time. So I use them and they have corporate insurance. And then I also use alternative balance and I have liability insurance. So, you know, lots of insurance. Um, the goal of course is always to just have people happy and not need it. That's the nature of insurance, but you want it in case you need it. Um, where can you learn or get assistance with telehealth regulations so we can be in a compliance across state lines? That's a great question. Um, I've used three different attorneys and attorneys can be really expensive. So I just help my clients a lot and keep it affordable. Um, probably my favorite attorney uh, to work with um, would be the functional lawyer. Um, so that's an option and I can um, give you a referral. I might have a link where you can get a little savings. I don't know. I have to look, but um, I might have a resource for that. So email, you, email me if you want it. Um, so Scott, he's a good guy, very helpful. And his wife's a DO. So he's not just being a lawyer doing this, but it's like right in his family. He gets it. Um, 
And then it depends on the license. Like our registered dietitian, she can actually work in the most states. So um, some of the nurses that I have as clients, they, especially if um, they're a nurse practitioner. So sometimes it depends on um, reciprocal agreements with states. So going to your state board is always good, specific to your license and, um, or the other state, their state board and seeing what's required. Um, I am licensed in um, a couple different places. So um, sometimes there's states where it's not difficult for you to get an additional license. And there's other ones where you're thinking, forget it. But um, I'll just be perfectly honest. You can absolutely be successful just in your state and just in your town. So don't feel like you have to see everyone everywhere. It's, it's really not necessary. If you want to do it, you can. Um, and then let me make one more important um, clarification there. There is a difference between seeing a patient, doing a one-on-one -on -one visit and leading a course. So let's say you're licensed in California and you're only gonna see patients in California. Great, good call. Um, but you wanna teach a course. Let's say you wanna teach like a thyroid health course. You can have a paid course and that could be open to people anywhere in the world it's not a doctor patient relationship. And you can even do live Q and A, that's fine. You just have to make sure you stay within that educational realm and don't move into like private one-on-one -on -one or um, you know, highly specific. Now you're um, acting as the doctor and practitioner. Okay, let's see. This is a good question. How do you keep your oldest clients at original prices when, you, oh, do I keep oldest clients at original prices when you increase? Um, there's times that I have done that. Right now, everyone's at the same price, but um, the uh, maybe the first one or two price increases I did, I kept the um, existing patients at their price and I told them for at least a year. And then um, some of the people who do our little uh, membership option, um, sometimes I do like when I know the price is going to go up. Uh, so often in January, it goes up. So then maybe around November or December, I will say we're going to have a sale, which you can buy next year's membership at the price right now, instead of having to pay the price increase. So um, that can usually be quite helpful. Um, everything's fine. It's just what, what you want to do and what's going to work for your practice. I like your questions. Good job. Any other questions? Okay. I think we did it. Not bad. What are we doing on time? Oh my gosh. Perfect. I love it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. And you know, it wouldn't be fun just talking to a a computer without uh, talking to you guys. Uh, what kind of membership do we have? Um, again, I have clients who have all different memberships, including some where their whole practice is membership. We have what we call a health savings plan. Um, and it's not a discount, by the way. Actually, they pay extra. Thank you for the feedback, Dr. Hutchinson. I appreciate it. Um, we, um, they basically pay for a certain number of visits, some of the health coaching visits and some practitioner visits. And then uh, they get 20% off supplements for the year. And so they pay that fee. They're basically just prepaying for some of the visits and a little bit extra. Um, and I tell them like, you know, if they don't need a lot of supplements, don't do it. It's not gonna be an advantage. But if they're needing like $200 or more a month in supplements, then it can be quite helpful. Um, and give them a significant saving. So, and that's about as salesy as we get, by the way. We just say, here's when it would make sense, here's when it wouldn't, and if it works for you, it's available. Um, and that's how we are, and, and it works quite nice in our practice. All right, um, hopefully I'll see some of you on that webinar, that Designs for Health one, where it's like all marketing, getting patients 2020. Um, it's called Business is Booming, Setting Up 2022 for the Win. So um, that should be a fun one to talk about. And we're going to get a little bit more into supplements too, but it's part of using supplements in marketing. So it's really all about patient growth. Um, that's a freebie one. Um, I'm teaching a class for patients, but you're always welcome to jump in on the 17th. It's called Depression Sucks. 
and it does, um, what you need to know on your uh, road to recovery. And I do it every time around this year because it's a tough time and a trigger for people. So um, our practitioners tend to watch it because I cover really all of what's known as far as typical medical options, holistic options, some unknown new medical discoveries, some non-invasive devices. You just have to have a lot of options when it comes to depression care. So um, there's that class. And then our FMA one is on the 20th. So, all right, thank you all. Bye, we'll uh, send out the recording. So uh, hopefully that will be helpful and we'll make the slides available too. Again, any other questions, team at thefunctionalmedicineacademy.com. We'll do our best to reply back and get your questions answered. Thanks.